everybody. My name is Caitlin Ryan, and I am a board member here at the Cannabis Alliance. And um, we are here today talking with John Kingsbury about the collapse of the medical market here in Washington State. Um, medical cannabis is something the Cannabis Alliance has been dedicated to since the very beginning. Our roots are in patient advocacy, and it's something that we are really concerned about, making sure it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. We do advocate for businesses as well, and we do believe that the two um, are better together rather than separately. Um, and we now have gotten ourselves here in Washington State into a situation where um, the collapse of our medical program is now at this point imminent, unless something dramatic happens uh, in the legislature, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. John's been working really hard on um, collecting data and really assessing how bad it actually is. And uh, we're going to get into it here in a minute. Um, here at the Cannabis Alliance, we are dedicated to the advancement of a vital, ethical, equitable, and sustainable cannabis industry. And um, talking about patient needs is firmly in that mission statement. Um, John, you've been working on patient advocacy since the passage of I-502. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what brought you to this passion? And um, we are grateful that you also have an aptitude for it. Um, so uh, how did you come to working on, on cannabis and patient issues? Well, as a patient myself, I started prior to uh, the passage of 5052. And um, what really got me passionate and involved was that I saw that people like me were um, being talked about as though we were criminals, uh, as though we were frauds. And so I thought, you know, there needs to be an organized voice out there that says, no, actually, we're real people with real needs. And we need a system that um, doesn't just say, go to the rec store and buy what everybody else is buying. Um, my brain is such that I'm kind of, I, I like to dig into data, which is sort of about what our presentation is today, um, because I think if you make an assertion, you need to be able to back up what you're saying, if that's at all possible. Um, and as I got more and more into it, I, I found, as you said, that I, I have a passion for it. Um, I've not only um, worked on patient issues, I'm, of course, working on a couple of bills now, but um, that uh, whether it's regulation or whatever it is, it's I, I really think that patients kind of need to be a voice for themselves. Um, this organization has been very helpful towards advocating for patients, but I think that also in that uh, industry organization advocacy, that's, that's a rare beast really in this Washington state environment. So, I, I think patients need to be engaged, and I think that we are a significant part of the market, and if industry can find a way to serve us, then I think that's better for everybody. Um, so, Yeah, agreed, agreed. Now, um, I want to start with an old trope um, that came, was around before the passage of I-502, um, back when only medical was, was allowed in sort of this gray space. Um, and that is, oh, people are just patients uh, in order to get cannabis. People only want to become a patient just so that they have access to, to weed. Um, how true is that, that thinking? Well, I think in my... In the world that I see, that um, I think probably half the patients in that old world that I participated in probably was true. Um, I did see a lot of um, opportunists. Uh, I did see a lot of people saying, this is a route um, where I can get access. And I think that was true. Here's the difference. 5052 has given us stores where we can go in and we have dozens of choices on the shelf. We have, there's regular hours. And, and so I think the great tragedy of this is those people who were just trying to get weed, they have a great place to go now in our stores. What got lost in all of that is the patients who had real need, which probably were half of, half of you know, that old pre-2014 um, environment. And so I think that patients, ironically, even though uh, decriminalization 
started because of our medical, uh, the medical needs of people like me, we actually ended up getting left behind. I think recreational users are pretty well cared for in a lot of ways, uh, but patients have um, just sort of been left by the roadside. And I, I think the things that I wanna talk about today uh, really show that in a solid way that the consequences of this are sort of coming to a head. So, um, yeah, I want to um, ask you, you've mentioned 5052 a couple of times, of course, you and I know what that is. Um, right. But um, uh, maybe if you can give a little history, you know, we had medical first here in Washington State, we were on the early end of, of medical use. And then um, 2014, I-502 passed, allowing for adult use, which then left medical as its own entity in sort of this uh, gray market is what it was called. Right. Right? Um, and let's see, two years in was 50-52. At any rate, why don't you pick up there? What, what happened after I-502 passed? Yeah. So I-502 passed in 2012. Sorry. And in, and in 2014, what happened is stores, uh, recreational stores started to get licenses. So your, your, your regulated storefront started to open. Um, and then what people quickly realized, um, which was a legitimate concern, is there was still the old legacy medical market, which is your gray market storefronts and your farmers markets, that sort of thing. Um, and the thing with those is they were not heavily regulated, they didn't have taxes, and people said, you know, we've got this new regulated legal market, and then we've got this legacy gray market, and the two can't exist together. So um, the, the word that you would hear back then was, this is not tenable. So 5052 was um, cynically called the Cannabis Patients Protection Act. So you'll hear me say 5052 because I just, you know, calling it the Cannabis Patients Protection Act sort of sticks in my throat. Um, so that's why it's hard to identify. That was the discussion that started soon after stores began getting licenses and it passed in 2015. And the other way that that's often referred to by people is the merging of the markets, which is um, we're going to find a place within the 502 system that accesses you, the needs of patients, which are unique from the recreational user. Does that sort of yeah. give a good summary? Yeah, and I'll just add in here too, actually 5052 was sort of the impetus of the start of the Cannabis Alliance. Um, we're called the Cannabis Alliance because we were the merging of four smaller groups together um, who in the conversation in Olympia over 5052 found they were advocating for the same types of things um, and uh, decided, you know, we, we were going to be stronger if we banded together. Um, and uh, the other note I want to make about 5052 um, is it's probably one of the greater tragedies in a fight for equity here in Washington state. Um, the promise from LCB was that, um, from a licensee perspective, was that if you had a medical dispensary, uh, as long as you completed the application process, you would be brought into the I-502 system. And that ended up not being true. And this sort of speaks to where we're going to get to next, but it was the first culling of medically available product to folks. Um, the I think we some of the numbers I have heard um, it was nearly a 70% cut in um, not only dispensaries, but producer processors who were serving medical patients um, didn't, didn't make it in um, because of how it was administered. And at the time, the um, requirements for being able to be a licensee were, were pretty high around things like prior arrests, et cetera, which of course, if you're businesses uh, providing to people outside of the law. Um, even if that law is unjust, it still is the law. And so the likelihood of having priors um, were was pretty high amongst that population. Um, and we're, we're still grappling with the outcomes in terms of the loss for licensees, um, particularly around equity. However, it, like I said, was the first massive culling, but we've had quite a bit since then. It continues to shrink. So let's go ahead and, and dig into it. Um, are you, how about we get slides up and such? Okay. Sound good? So uh, just to fill in here, um, this makes a good transition, that discussion about 5052, because during 5052, um, 
while they said, we're going to restrict what you've been doing before and we're going to institute things like patient registries, um, we're going to provide, we're going to um, create some provisions for patients and their special needs. So part of the reason I believe that we're in the position we are today is because those provisions or those commitments to making provisions have not been well kept. And so 5052 was supposed to be implemented in 2016. And I think what we've seen a lot of is not non-implementation. And my thesis today will be basically that we're, we're hitting a wall here. And I'm gonna say something very bold right now in that I believe that if we don't take dramatic action this year, that by the end of the year, um, the system will collapse. And that will be my thesis um, because a lot of those commitments have not been kept. So when I make a statement like that, um, what you have to look at is what the trends are, what the data is, and then evaluate what, that, what the consequences of those might be. And the, the part I wanna spend the most amount of time in is the bottom part here. Um, the, there's uh, four items that are indicators of uh, where the market is going, um, what the state of medical cannabis is. And at the bottom, I wanna draw your attention to a project I've been working on since August, which is the number of stores maintaining medical endorsements. And I wanna spend the most time there because that's the infrastructure. Um, and if that disappears, that's, that's gonna be the end of it. And I think that we are in dire straits. And I'm gonna make the case at the end of this that we need to take radical immediate action. So uh, I think whenever you're making a statement such as trends or the bold of this, uh, you know, the state of the system, you need to have data that supports itself. I think one data line doesn't end. And some of these numbers are sort of, uh, Department of Health and LCB have had uh, rough data, I want to say. I'm going to have you go back to that main screen oh, there if you can, because yeah. um, I want to talk about each of these really quick, uh, and then we'll go on. Yeah. Okay. So you one of the ways in evaluating uh, data, if the data, any given piece is uncertain, is it, are there other pieces of data that support it? And I believe that there are in these. So the, the things I wanna look at is how many, how many patients are registered in the DOH database, um, the, the number of declared patient cooperatives. And so that would be ones that are registered at LCB and everybody's following the rules. Um, is the illicit market disappearing or are people like me still going there? And then lastly, the where I want, really wanna focus is on that infrastructure and the number of stores maintaining a medical endorsement. So let's go to the next slide. Um, as we do, if we can pause for a moment, um, when the medical system was created, what were the provisions that were put in place? What, what makes the medical system medical and different from um, adult use as it stands? That's a really, really good question. So our, um, our legal rights were curtailed. Um, the number of plants were reduced. And the, and the sort of deal was made that we're going to reduce your number of plants, we're going to reduce, uh, we're going to increase your paperwork requirements and your registry requirements. But what will happen is you'll get a, some arrest protection. We will uh, provide trained certified consultants who can help you at the stores. Um, we will um, create some requirements for having some medical grade product. Um, and that will create sort of a system within the regulated system that will uh, provide those provisions because recreational products are not necessarily medical products. And a lot of people, they don't, um, they need help when they go to the stores. So, um, and then if you join the registry, then you were supposed to get some additional legal protections. So those were essentially the, you know, the, the protections in exchange for the restrictions of rights and access. 
Right. And you said number of plants. So prior to 5052, if you were a patient or, you know, authorized patient, you could grow um, your own plants at home. And then so and then when this medical system, the, the one we're in now was created, still allowed, but a smaller number of plants. So it used to be 24. And that 24 was based on this rulemaking process that happened um, after the uh, Washington State Marijuana Act of 1998. So they, they had a process. And so the, the justification that I heard for trimming them back from 24 to 15 was um, that you were gonna have to, at that point, buy, buy the balance of your full needs in the store. The other thing that was really big was I could grow for a friend or two if they gave me my, not every patient can grow. In fact, most patients can't grow for themselves. So I might grow 45 plants and, and I could give some to you and I could give some to you. And then it was sort of a, it was an unregistered cooperative really, but it wasn't, it didn't involve sales. I could only uh, give those to the patients who, um, whose papers I held, so. Um, so the so the ability to grow together was substantially reduced. Yeah, and I want to also just sort of flag uh, the comment you made about um, uh, medical consultants and the and the need for those. And and I can attest to this from personal experience. You know, most um, traditional physicians, allopathic doctors. I've got a kiddo with epilepsy, and um, the recommendation there is yes, uh, you should uh, go ahead and figure out how to do that. <laughs> Right. So when my doctor Have you any recommendations other than yes, I think this is a good idea. And then it's just up to, to me to figure that out. When I um, started with medical cannabis, my neurologist said to me, you're a perfect candidate for this. Um, it's less harmful to you. You seem street savvy. I'm going to give you a phone number. Unfortunately, there's no good way to access and what you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to ask people, you're gonna to have to learn from their experience, you're gonna to have to try some things, some things will work, some will not. And at the end of that, you'll either have found a great new tool or at least, or it won't work for you and at least you'll have tried. And that's sort of a crummy way to receive medical care, yeah. but that was, that was my beginning. So really the promise of having knowledgeable consultants who can sort of help you navigate would have been huge and, and is huge to the extent that you can actually find people like that within the system. There are a few, um, but you still have to really search for them. That certification clearly doesn't guarantee that level of help. So, mm -hmm. um, but that was one of the promises. So is this the next slide? It is. Okay. So the first indication of the health of the system is um, patient registration. And the purpose of this slide here is to illustrate that the um, Department of Health, the state of Washington is unique in that we don't know how many registered patients there are at a given time. And uh, we're unique in that way. Um, and so what you'll see here are two charts of trends and numbers, both created by Department of Health. One was created at, at the end of 2019 and the other one was created during 2021. And this is their history of the numbers of patients and what the trend has been. And you can see just from looking at these that they don't reflect the same thing at all. Yet, and, and the point I'm making here is that Department of Health doesn't really know. And I think sometimes, um, even though this is a harsh thing to say, um, they'll create a chart that indicates whatever it is their point they're trying to push across. What I really would like to you to point, what I would like to point to is the chart on the right here. Um, the numbers have been inflated by about 4,000 um, per year based on where I think reality is, but I want you to pay attention to the trend line on the right-hand chart because you're gonna see that trend line 
again and again in this presentation. And I believe that the trend on the right-hand side uh, is accurate and will reinforce the other data. So uh, yeah. e even though I disagree with the numbers, but the point here is that Department of Health doesn't know. And when you see, there's a 2020 chart that's different from these two as well. So next slide. Um, just really quickly, um, why do you think that is? You know, I was on the Colorado Medical uh, website yesterday, um, just looking at their data, and it's very clear, very user friendly. Um, what do you think is the challenge for the Department of Health? Uh, I think their database is a mess. I, I think the structure of their database is, is um, I think they have a way to enter patients and they can withdraw patients one at a time, but I don't think the programming of whatever their system database is, for whatever reason, is basic of a function as you would think that is, um, do, doesn't support that. Um, I know they're asking for money. By the time they get that money, I think there's going to be no patients in the registry really to, <laughs> to monitor. But I, I just think it's the architecture of the database. I think they have a place to store stuff, but they don't have any way of retrieving it in an organized way. Uh, maybe Gregory Foster has an opinion on that, but um, I think that's what it is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So this, this here, I believe, is an accurate trend. And it is closer to that chart on the right-hand side from the previous trend. And I believe that these are the best, most accurate numbers in history um, that I can come up with. And I'll, I'll tell you where these numbers are different from the other ones. They're, they're similar to the, the right-hand chart from 2021 that you saw before but the numbers are about 4,000 lower per year. And I'll, no, go forward, go back to this. So let me tell you where these numbers come from because I think that's really important. Every September, um, there's a work session and Department of Health was often asked to come up with a number of patients in the registry and they would start fresh and they have to do a bunch of number crunching. In order for them to figure out how many patients are in the database at a given time. They have to take a bunch of raw data and do a bunch of math problems. So the numbers on this chart came from their reports every September. And they also reflect what I saw in the real world, which is the patients sort of jumped in in 2017. So implementation for 5052 yeah. happened in 2016. Um, I saw patients registering up till 2017, and then what I witnessed in the real world was starting in 2017, patients started getting up that any of the promises would materialize for them. Because patients can't wait three years, we're managing our health care every day, and they gave it a year, and then they started becoming disillusioned and dropping out. That was the world that I saw around me but also this trend line is supported by the other data. And also every year, uh, DOH was taking a fresh look at their numbers and doing those calculations anew. So I believe this chart is an accurate history of what the numbers were and what the trends were. Um, I've heard arguments that the number is lower than this, has been lower than this by 2000. Uh, I haven't seen the supporting data, but. I, but I really, I, I believe that this is the best history that we can get. So anyway, um, but we'll go into the next thing. Yeah, and before we do, um, I just wanna point out, like I said, it was on Colorado's uh, yesterday, we have um, a significantly higher population here in Washington state and their registry is, seems to be hovering the last couple of years right around 80,000. Right. Um, and you'll see here that in 2021, we're, we're now below the 10,000 mark. Um, and, and to your point about it, maybe even smaller than that as uh, you know, we're now a, a full year after that. And uh, if this line continues, uh, it, it would make sense that, that we're even smaller now. And so even though we have a much smaller participation rate in numbers, we also have 2 million more citizens. Mm -hmm. So if you 
calculate it per capita, the difference is even much greater. So, yeah. okay, another indicator that I looked at, that I've looked at, tried to look at from year to year are um, how many cooperative gardens there are. So that's a hard thing to tease out because what you get from LCB, um, our sheets of it, they, they come out as license holders and, and they're all sort of in weird states of uh, functioning. So you'll get a list, but you don't know whether those are open or not. So I've spent a lot of time since 2017, I think, trying to look at those. Um, these are the best numbers. 2022 was pretty easy for me because a lot of gardens just dropped out. So the meaningfulness that I get out of this is how many patients are engaged. I know there's a lot of community gardens around this county um, that are that involve patients holding valid authorizations, but they're not engaged in the regulated cooperative system. Now, in my opinion, the, the cooperative garden system that was established by 5052 was designed to deter participation. And as you can see here from the numbers, whether it's 21 or it's five, that that, that intent to sort of deter participation has worked beautifully, but only to the extent that it has kept valid patients from participating in the regulated scheme. And here's the tragedy of this. If people are gardening together and they're not in the regulated scheme, they put themselves at criminal liability. And so they've made this decision that it is better for them to break the law than it is to participate in the law, even though they're holding valid authorizations. And I think that's the real tragedy here that I've really seen since 5052, where evading the law for valid patients, holding authorizations is a more workable solution than participating in the options that the system has provided. Um, so I really wanna stress that point. The next part here, um, um, before you move on, though, really quickly, um, is uh, for what about the new um, cooperative regulations do you think are so untenable? Um, what are the rules that that make it hard to comply with? Well, so for one thing, people need to register to participate. <coughs> so there's layers of deterrence. People need to register to participate. The registration rate in this um, state is very low. Um, you, uh, LCB has the right to expect a garden during reasonable hours, basically on demand. And I think people find that very frightening. They don't need a warrant or, you know, reasonable suspicion. They can just inspect it. Right, which is true of our licensees, but this is a very different setup, right? You would expect that uh, if you're running a business, but we're talking about people's homes, right? Right, and you also need to participate in traceability. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, too, is um, there's a rule in there, which I just think is mean spirited, that says if you participate in a garden, you, you have to participate in the gardening. Well, I would love to grow plants for somebody with MS or somebody that has a debilitating physical state and give them the plants because growing 10 plants or 30 plants isn't that much more of a burden than growing 15. But there's a rule in there that says, whoever's participating in the garden has to participate in the, in the gardening. Right. I can't just grow for you and give you plants. And I think that's mean spirited. And I think that's a provision that absolutely should be changed. Um, so there's these layers of rules. The guard has to be attached to someone's house. You can't just go find a space somewhere and garden there. Um, so some people feel like it gives the LCB the ability to, to kind of enter their house at will without a warrant. So there's yeah. just lots and lots of layers of stuff like that that you know 
keep yeah. people from no, that makes sense. Um, I would not be excited about inviting that level of access to my home. Um, and, there, and there's arbitrary rules. Like if you're a mile away from a store or a mile away from a school, you can't have a cooperative garden. Well, what difference does that make, right? So like I said, it was really designed to deter participation and it really worked beautifully with that intent in mind. The problem is, is it forces legitimate patients to go underground. Yeah. And that's not what decriminalization is about. And if you want to recriminalize people, patients are the meanest, me most mean spirited w way to go after people, I think. Yeah. So, well, and when you say criminal activity, we're not talking uh, a ticket or a fine or a misdemeanor. We're talking about a felony. We're talking about a class C felony. Class C felony here in Washington. State. Right. Yeah. So, if you beat your wife, that's um, generally. Uh, a gross misdemeanor for the most part. Um, so um, the other thing I wanted to look at, and this is a really problematic statistic, but um, is how many unregulated farmers markets out there? Well, the thing is, there's no registry for those. You have to ask people. So I admit freely that these numbers are unreliable. Um, but what I see is gro a growing number that me and my friends are able to discover and document. Here's the important statistic and why I find this meaningful, even though those numbers are highly unreliable. <coughs> I've, we've seen maybe three of those disappear. And so they're not disappearing, they're staying and then we're finding more and more. Mm -hmm. So even though it's a really unreliable number, they're not shutting down. And if we have a market that's working for patients, why aren't they shutting down? Why aren't those patients going into retail stores, right? Yeah. So next slide. Um, and again, before, sorry, I keep stopping us. No, that's fine. <laughs> the way. But I think that this one is really critical in terms of the indictment of how the system was set up and the, the promise of the things that could work really, really well, and then the need for other parts to be um, deeply reformed. And I think farmers markets is a good example because it wasn't just about accessing cannabis and it was... Uh, also where people were able to talk to, gather and talk to each other and gain knowledge and, and maybe speak to other folks who might have similar um, medical conditions and, and share here, this is working for me, or, you know, this isn't working for me or share growing uh, methods or, you know, whatever the case is. It was also that place of information um, that the system right. had intended to uh, supplant with uh, medical consultants, you know, trained folks instead of this, um, you know, word of mouth, you know, trial, trial and error situation. Um, another piece of things too, is that um, at, at farmers markets, there's good and bad, right? There's uh, the opportunity to get to know your farmer, learn their, their cultivation techniques, um, really get specific, maybe even make some special requests, et cetera. Um, but then there is also unregulated cannabis, unregulated concentrates, um, potentially dangerous product um, that that may not, that has no oversight at all whatsoever. Um, and you know, so there's so challenges there too. So just to build on the points that you expressed, um, when we went, when we were supposed to go away from this sort of activity uh, towards a regulated market where people went into the stores, where patients went into the stores, um, we need to recognize that again, the farmer's markets and some of that activity provided some important things. Some of those could be replaced, some couldn't. So one of the things that, I, again, as you mentioned, was getting, getting good help. So farmer's markets, you could go talk to people. And that's essentially how I started to learn, right? And those were supposed to be replaced by uh, cannabis consultants. Well, in not all the stores, but in many of the stores, they go, oh, so you want Indica or Sativa? Oh, medical, does that mean you want CBD? And that's kind of the, that's kind of what you get. And you still really have to seek out those knowledgeable people. The other part of it the, um, was the charity part. 
a tr farmers markets have provided an incredible amount of charity. And I would think if we can make one improvement that just lends more humaneness to our regulated system is we need to create more avenues for charity. It's expressly prohibited. And, and I think that's indicative of the fact that the emphasis when the markets were merged was that the state was more concerned about not losing tax revenues than they were about taking care of genuinely sick people. So there was a lot of charity um, that that's provided in those markets that it was not replaced in the regulated market. And that, that's just senseless because not everything should be about money. Um, the other thing that um, farmers markets provided that the stores just can't really is social work. An awful lot of, of, of social support, people talking to each other, people who have the same struggles. Um, I don't know how you reproduce that in a 502 environment, but it, I think it is one reason why they have persisted is that culture, uh, that patient culture. So um, that's my two cents on that. Let's go to the next slide if you... So here's the part I really wanna focus on. And the first thing I wanna point out here is that the trend line is very similar to the patient registration line. Um, and just like the collapse of compliant products, some of this has to introduces the chicken and the egg problem. Um, it, it has, uh, the availability of DOH compliant product collapsed because nobody was asking for it or was nobody asking for it because buyers weren't buying it and consultants didn't know about it and they couldn't ed educate customers on it. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to know what the starting point is, but what you get is you've got all these factors that sort of create a perfect storm for the system to collapse. And, and so I want to, as an analogy, I want to compare the collapse of DOH compliant products um, as sort of the same phenomenon as, as medically endorsed stores. So what you're gonna see here, what you do see here is something analogous to what I showed with patient registration data, which is this doesn't correspond to LCB data at all. So what LCB, and, and let me explain these numbers briefly and then I'll explain what I think they mean. If you look at LCB's chart today, they'll, do, they'll show you 253 stores, I think on their list, something like that, maybe 249. That are currently holding medical endorsements. That, that they say are, that are on their list. Now, a month ago, they said it was 289. Well, what, what we can reasonably assume is that, you know, 40 some stores didn't close down last month, right? Mm -hmm. The list changed, but the number of stores that were uh, providing the uh, services associated with medical endorsements probably didn't change by 40 last month. And, th and that's sort of an indicator that their, their list isn't that reliable. Here's what I believe this list represents. This lep list represents the number of stores that can register patients and a history of a timeline. Now, when you have two agencies, Department of Health and LCB, that have lists that don't correspond um, to stores that are actually meeting the requirements for holding endorsements, again, you have to do what you did with patient, um, the patient registration data. And what I did here in this case is I looked at snapshots and there's snapshots of data everywhere. For years, and maybe still today, Department of Health and LCB would have, they'd say there's five, 499 stores and 289 of them are active. So what's an inactive store? Well, an inactive store is a store that hasn't logged into the database and can't apparently provide any of of the services associated with a medical endorsement, yet LCBs is still giving them an endorsement. So it, it has no bearing, that 499 doesn't mean anything, but those stores may still be on their list. Mm -hmm. um, 
So this, this chart here is an attempt to identify how many stores were able to meet most of the requirements. The one requirement I never check or care about is do they have DOH compliant product in stock? Because if that were an enforced requirement, we would have five stores, right? <laughs> so, um, but registering the patient, being able to register patients and issue recognition cards is my hallmark for whether they belong in this list and meet the requirements. And, I, and I'll explain in a moment why that's the critical difference. Um, what you see here again is this trend line. And what you see is a steady decline that aligns with the decline in, in patient uh, registrations. And the way I started this project last August was I was getting patients calling me saying, where can I go register? Now that's not, registering is not a popular activity in this state. So when I get multiple calls about that, it catches my attention. And so what I'd always say to them is go to the DOH list because the LCV list is garbage. And I'd get people to call me back and say, I called six stores before I could find one. You know, I called, in one case, I had somebody say, I called 15 stores before on the list, 15 stores that were on the list before I could find one that would actually issue me a recognition card. And that caught my attention. Mm -hmm. And so as is my nature to do, I got curious and I pulled the list and I started calling and just sort of vetting the stores, interviewing them. Can you do this? Can you do that? And what I noticed right away <clears throat> was that half the stores on the list denied being medically endorsed at all or meeting any of the requirements. They'd say, no, we're not endorsed. And I'd have gotten their name off that list. Well, that, that caught my attention right away. Uh, and so to validate or in invalidate that response to the calls I was getting, I went and I got an airlift well, list. How many stores are registered um, in the airlift system so that they can issue recognition cards if they choose to, or you know, that, that are set up? And what I noticed right away is that there were 132 stores on that list. So that corresponded to the information I was getting on the phone that half the stores on the list didn't even think they were medically endorsed and hadn't made any efforts to. Well, that's a dramatic cut right away. Yeah. And what it indicated to me and really grabbed my attention was we don't have the system that the agencies say we have or think we have. And in fact, they have no idea. And my explanation for that, I won't go in too deeply into this is how that part happened is because you got a medical endorsement just for asking for one. A lot of those stores got those licenses, those endorsements when they got their license and never complied, never tried to set up the system from day one. And no one ever went back and audited it or checked. So I'll give you an example. Since 2018, I've been calling Cannabis and Glass. So the first, I called them because uh, Brian Smith over at LCB had um, in response to a, <laughs> a contentious hearing at JLARC said, no, we have lots of medically compliant product. And he issued a completely bogus inventory of, of medically compliant product in the system. And I asked for a copy of that. And when I edited it, I noticed that the most units of medically compliant product were at a store called Cannabis and Glass. This was in 2018. And when I called them, they said, we don't have that. We're not gonna get that. We're not even medical stores. So I knew in that case that those stores had never ever complied. Mm -hmm. So fast forward uh, to last August, these results, with the airlift list and with my calls and my knowledge that a lot of these stores had never been on said, okay, I want to know more about this. And as I basically what I did was I took the entire LCB list and I ca I've called all but nine stores on that list. It took me weeks. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I noticed that half the stores didn't exist. And then a percentage of the stores thought they were medically endorsed, but they weren't really meeting the requirements. They couldn't register patients. And again, I'll explain why that's important in a minute. And then 
I noticed that it dripped down here. If you look at 2019, 2020, yeah. you start to see a precipitous drop. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's related to the pandemic. And I'll tell you why is because a certain percentage of the stores said, we used to do it, we wanted to do it, but we lost our consultant and we can't get another one. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why when you look at 21, uh, 2021, 2022, and 2020, now 2023, that we had that additional precipitous drop. So all these factors are combining to rip down the medical uh, endorsement system. Here's why this is critical. And here's why I think we're in a critical part this year. If you look at this trend <coughs> on this curve, by the end of the year, we may not have enough stores for patients who even wanna register. They may not be available. I called a store in OMAC and they said, you're gonna to have to go to Spokane or Yakima or Seattle. Well, if you have somebody who is, maybe has physical limitations, maybe has monetary limitations as a result of their illness, that's just impractical, right? And so what that'll do, what happens is then you get this feedback system where even the patients who wanna register, which, isn't, which aren't many in the state, the barriers become so high that they can't do it even if they want to, right? right. And then we get into this collapse situation. And this is why I am so concerned. Because yeah. those, for many of those patients, ever all of those patients who register that I've talked to, they do so because they feel like it gives them additional legal protection. I have never talked to anybody who said, well, I registered so I could buy three ounces of cannabis. I've never met anyone who's ever said that to me. They all do it because they feel like if they're going to grow their extra plants, they want that legal protection. Mm -hmm or that, at least that perception of it. So yeah. let me tell you where that 87 comes from. Because if you look at the LCB list today, it says 253 stores or 249 or something. That 87 is based upon the fact that this curve follows the trend. We know that 259 or 253 has never been right. <clears throat> when I called all of the stores and I and my criteria was, can you register patients? Again, this is a requirement in the law for holding an endorsement. <clears throat> I found 78 who I could confirm did. I found a few more who were going, to, who seemed to indicate that they wanted to fulfill the requirements in the near future and seemed to be taking the steps to do it. And then on top of this 87, there were nine I could never get a hold of. So if all of those are endorsed or if all of those are meeting the requirements and I just couldn't get a hold of them, then the number would be 96. But that's a really tiny number. And we're talking about a point where you may only be able to register if you live in King County and Spokane County and, you know, Whatcom County. Yeah, there are whole hunks um, of the state, I think, where you'd have to drive a couple hundred miles in order to, right. to get your endorsement. There are big distances in the state. So I went to the county, there's a, there's a map that says, where are the medically endorsed stores? And I started crossing out those stores and there's large sections of the state where you don't have the option to without really going to a lot of trouble. Yeah. And again, the tragedy here is that you're taking the most vulnerable people and you're saying, yeah, there's a law, but it, you can't practically comply with it. Right. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. Yeah. And I was going to, um, as we talk about this, um, we'll, I'd like to move into also um, some recommendations for what we can do um, about this, if there is right. any. So here's the problem. Um, I think that we are, we're starting to run out of choices. I talked about the big tragedy here, patients losing their legal protections, including arrest protections. There's gonna be a point where um, you can't have a sales tax exemption <laughs> if you can't get registered. The third thing here I wanna point out before I sort of fast forward into what we can do is um, 
we've been working really hard on the excise tax exemption bill, which I think would be huge. 37% excise tax, I think is a big uh, incentive for patients to stay out of the market. That's money that doesn't go into the pockets of licensed producers. I think that would be huge. Um, and the last thing I wanna point out here is that 502, the state of Washington, gets its safe harbor. It gets its, its um, commitment from the federal government. In fact, all states get their commitment from the federal government not to intervene, not based on how they run their recreational systems, but on the, on the basis that we have a medical cannabis system. And if the reg if medical indoor stores collapse and the registry collapses, what claim do we have that we have any medical system? So the state can really lose its its commitment from the federal government not to intervene. So next slide. Okay, so if you're going to create solutions, you have to get realistic about what the problems are. Mm -hmm. um, and what we need to realize is this is not a discussion we can have for the next two years. We've waited seven years and we're beyond that. We have to act this year. And what that means is that we need to take radical dramatic action. And we can't say, well, we'll have delivery and then a couple of years we'll expand it to that. We're way past that point. And what we have to do is look at realistically what the problems are. And I think that all we can try and do at this point is um, address where the biggest issues are. Hit, hit the big items. We can't worry about all the little details. And then we have to understand what those problems are. And, we, and I think what we, the only option we have to stop this free fall we're in is to try and get patients more comfortable with registering. And we have to address the, the it's amazing to me year after year that I do, when I do surveys, how consistent patients are about how the system is not meeting their needs. And they say they fear engaging, they fear their legal status. I thought it would be, I'm paying too much taxes. But when I survey patients, the number one fear, the number one thing they want addressed every year is, I feel legally vulnerable. The second thing they say is lack of ability to participate. So, um, I can't get the products I need. That's another thing that's at the top of the list. Lack of appropriate uh, products. And I can just get what I need better out of the illicit market. So those are the two things. Let's go to the next slide. So with that um, knowledge, what do we do with that? I Caitlin? Yeah, well, and I was just going to say, um, along that, you know, we've talked about the lack of available product, and I just want to point out there are only four DOH compliant uh, producer processors here in Washington State, and then spread that out across all of the stores. Um, again, there can be medicine deserts, um, and I do want to shamelessly put out there that our sponsor for today's webinar, Skagit Organics, is one of the four. Um, and then in addition to that is Fairwinds, um, Polite, and uh, Trailblazing. And that's it. And that's double what it was a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, we only had two. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's a that's a big challenge. And again, this goes to the, um, you know, what's the chicken and the egg? Do the producers collapse <coughs> because there was no demand or did patients quit buying and, and store buyers quit buying it because it's not available? You just don't know at a point. So really what we need is sort of an adrenaline injection because we're, we're at a crisis and we need to address it that way. And we, we know why patients don't participate and about all we can do is try to get patients to participate based on what they say is keeping them out of the market, keeping them from registering, keeping them from going into medic, you know, medically endorsed stores. So stores will say, oh, we wanna keep our endorsement. And producers can say, oh, we wanna make this product available, right? And those two things are arrest protection, which goes straight to the number one thing that I hear every year, which is patients are afraid of their legal status. Right now, if I hold a valid authorization. And if I'm growing within the law and, and for whatever reason, 
a law enforcement comes into my house, they can still rip down my garden and, and arrest me. And that is crazy if I'm following the law. The, the fear that patients have of their legal status is entirely rational in this state. And so I'm, to address that number one fear, we need to give patients who are following the law arrest protection. So you don't have to fear that. You should, uh, um, the second thing I think that I really like that they've been working on is the excise tax exemption um, on DOH product. And let me tell you why. It hits so many of those points that patients complain about. I can't get appropriate product. The product's not clean enough. And when I can find it, it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Taking that 37% excise tax off for patients, when the incentive is to join, to join this collapsing registry, hits so many of the points all at one with one effort. And you don't find initiatives like that very often or legislation like that very often where it addresses so many of the weaknesses at once. It'll stimulate um, producers' incentive to produce this product. And I guarantee the bud tenders and the buyers that have no idea what that product is now, if you put an excise tax exemption on it, they'll figure it out what it is. Yeah. Right? And yeah. the other thing too is they'll say, we want to be able to sell this product. And that's going to require having a, um, um, you know, with an excise tax exemption, that's going to require us maintaining a medical uh, endorsement. Mm -hmm. And so it yeah. addresses all these big issues in one fell swoop. And I you think know, really for emergency intervention, these are the two things that we need to do. And we need to do them this year because the system will collapse by the end yeah. of the year. Yeah, you know, and to illustrate that, actually, I had a conversation um, with an owner of one of the retail stores who is medically endorsed and is well known, has a long history in the medical um, market long before I-502. And um, they were saying, you know, that they were always surprised, sort of perplexed by um, folks who come in to get their medical card. Um, but then, uh, say, Hey, is, can I get my authorization? I'm not going to buy anything, but I just need the authorization. And, you know, it's like, well, of course say yes. So it's like, you know, that, that kind of hurts in terms of the store and, and right. you know, where they're at. And I said, yeah, well, you know, it makes a lot of sense to me if somebody needs that authorization in order to grow their own cannabis and can't afford what's in the store. Imagine if, we didn't have the <coughs> excise tax, how differently that conversation might, might go. Um, right. Uh, and he is, yeah, that would change everything um, moving forward. So this is, a, this may be a small fiscal note, but it's strong medicine. Yeah. And, and I think that we need it now. And I think next year it'll be too late. I honestly believe that the data and the trends that I'm seeing it's going to be too late. Yeah. So uh, again, I'm really passionate about this. And you can see I put a lot of work into data collection, just the number of calls I've made this year. Oh, man, so. John, thank you so much for all of this work. You know, it's it's stuff that um, we know and sort of a um, uh, was sort of looking for. Um, you know, just in stories and, and how we talk to, you know, we talk to a lot of people and, you know, get, get a lay of the land, but to actually have numbers to it. Um, I remember when you first approached me with what you were finding, it's infinitely worse than I thought it was. It is. Um, yeah. And, and then put that in front of the regulators and the agencies in charge of this. And to your, your earliest point, I don't think they know what the picture is at all, like not even on that anecdotal level no. that I was talking about to begin with. But then um, on top of that, you know, if you don't have the right numbers, you don't know how dire the reality is. And the right. reality that you have presented is like you said, it's an emergency. We're in crisis and it's about to go away. Um, and all of the implications of that is, is a failed adult use system, right? We started this so that patients had access to safe medicine, regulated medicine. It was to end the illicit market and um, you know, all of the all of the various 
problems that come along with an unregulated illicit market. And instead, what this has done and how it was created as a 50-52 is, is, is an exact opposite. It's a recreation uh, with higher criminal um, challenges uh, for people. It's sort of a bait and switch, right? Here, come join this. And then now we're going to put you in a worse position than, than you were to begin with. Right. And the, and the tragedy of it is it victimizes the most vulnerable people. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I will say, um, if everybody wants to check out, um, last year we did had a conversation with Amani Barberin, um, which some of you may know uh, as a, a patient advocate, not necessarily in cannabis, but particularly disabilities advocate, um, and just talking about the general challenges uh, that folks go through not having to navigate a, a convoluted system like this one. Um, and then uh, this is people's frontline um, medical care in a lot of cases. And, and if this is what they're having to navigate, uh, like you said, I think cruel and mean uh, is, is, is the right word for it. And I don't know, uh, I want to be careful to say, you know, that I don't know that that was the intent. Um, I think there are some unintended consequences here for sure. Um, however, there are some, some parts that, that very clearly were poison pills for this program to begin with that with simple changes could uh, turn this into to what it should, should be. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you, John. Um, I think I might have seen something in the chat from one of our guests here. I'm going to go ahead and close down the slide. Um, and Matt, did you want to hop in with a, a comment here before we wrap up? I was just going, I was just asking if it was um, okay to chime in with a couple solutions that we've been trying to work on as a company, but I think you guys covered some things pretty well. Um, the, okay. the only thing I will say is if, if people do want to connect, have an easier time connecting with DOH consultants, they can go to uh, website skagitwellness.com and schedule an appointment there and they will, a DOH consultant will reach out to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, knowledgeable help is so important. I mean, it's healthcare, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's almost too obvious to say. Knowledgeable help is critical. Is everything. I mean, I feel like I have the best minds at my fingertips and still sometimes struggle to figure out um, what, what we're doing over here. Um, and, and so uh, thank you, Matt, for, for setting that up and finding ways to meet the needs of folks um, while our regulators are, are still trying to figure out what the actual problem is. So um, deeply appreciate that and deeply appreciate um, the high quality medicine that, that you provide to folks. And um, right now, some producer processors and stores are allowed to, you know, John, you had mentioned charity um, donate and uh, Matt is in that, that group Scadget Organics is as well as Dockside and a few others um, who really are doing their very best within the law to help patients out. Um, but I, I think that that return to the spirit of, of community and assistance and, and true medical care um, is what will help all of us move forward. Well, and as sad as the data is that John collected, um, yeah, big thank you to him for putting the effort in to get all that together in a way that allows people to see what the actual state of the patient market is. Yeah, yeah. yes, John. So, thank, thank you, John. Yeah, and thank you both for being a part of the Cannabis Alliance. Man, we got the greatest crowd of folks. Uh, I'm just blessed every day that I get to work with people like you um, who are also dedicated to the advancement of a vital, ethical, equitable, and sustainable cannabis industry. Um, we'll be back here next week uh, talking with Headset about um, the data trends in a challenging medical market. Um, so we'll see you back here next Wednesday at noon, and um, I hope you all have a great rest of the week. Hi, everyone. Skagit Organics, pesticide-free cannabis and DOH-compliant RSO. Available in over 200 stores in Washington State clean, consistent cannabis products, born and blazed in the beautiful Skagit Valley.
We are proven leaders in the cannabis industry through our involvement with the Cannabis Alliance and our dedication to the medical cannabis community. Skagit Organics products are so good, you'll wonder why you ever tried anything else.